Hey everyone, my name is Faustine Ramirez and I'm a master tutor with Med School Coach. And today we'll be reviewing a SEPTUCK medicine question. So let's start by reading the stem. A 48 year old woman presents to the emergency department with two days of worsening abdominal pain and decreased appetite. She woke up in the middle of the night last night with chills and has had two episodes of vomiting since then. She has a history of GERD and hypertension. She takes omeprazole occasionally and amlodipine daily. She drinks one glass of wine daily with dinner and denies illicit drug or tobacco use. Upon arrival, she appears very uncomfortable. Temperature is 38.4 Celsius, blood pressure is 128 over 74, heart rate is 106 and respiratory rate is 18. BMI is 33. Examination is notable for mild scleral icterus. The abdomen is soft and non-distended with tenderness to palpation in the right upper quadrant without rebound or guarding. Bowel sounds are normal. Laboratory studies reveal the following. Abdominal ultrasound reveals dilated biliary ducts and no fluid collections. IV fluids and piperacillin tazobactam are initiated. What is the most appropriate next step? So I'd like you to pause the video for a moment and try to work through this question on your own first. All right, welcome back. So let's approach this question together. So as always, our first step is going to be to read the very last sentence um, to see what the question itself is asking us. So what is the most appropriate next step? So by reading this, we know that this is going to be a management question. It's not going to be a diagnosis question. And we glance at the answer choices very briefly. We just take a few seconds and we see that they involve a number of um, procedures um, or um, medication changes. Um, some of them are imaging procedures. Some of them are um, interventions. And so we need to keep a broad mind when we're reading this question stem because um, there's a lot of different possible answer choices here. So we just take a few seconds to look at these to already see we should be thinking about some form of potential medication or intervention. Um, but that's all that we can glean from these answer choices. And then we will read from the top. So this is going to be a classic board's question with two steps. The first step is going to be to identify the diagnosis, and the second step will be to answer a specific question about the diagnosis. And the specific question is going to be about management. So when we're reading this question stem, we should be thinking about um, highlighting the key elements that can help us identify what the diagnosis is. So we'll highlight the key elements. A 48-year-old woman presents to the emergency department with two days of worsening abdominal pain and decreased appetite. She woke up in the middle of the night last night with chills and has had two episodes of vomiting since then. She has a history of GERD and hypertension. She takes omeprazole occasionally and amlodipine daily. She drinks one glass of wine daily with dinner and denies illicit drug or tobacco use. Upon arrival, she appears very uncomfortable. Temperature is 38.4 Celsius. Blood pressure is 120 over 74. Heart rate is 106 and respiratory rate is 18. BMI is 33. Whenever I read vital signs, I recommend highlighting the abnormal vital signs because often they are key parts of the presentation um, and will be important in identifying what the diagnosis is. Examination is notable for mild scleral icterus. The abdomen is soft and non-extended with tenderness to palpation in the right upper quadrant without rebound or guarding. Bowel sounds are normal and laboratory studies reveal the following. So let's take a look at these labs. Again, with laboratory studies, I recommend highlighting the abnormal studies. And that is to save time. Um, once you check the values that you're given with the reference values, that takes a lot of time. And so the idea with highlighting these is that you never have to go look at the reference values again. Once you highlight them as being abnormal, you know they're abnormal and you don't have to check what the reference range is again. And what I recommend doing is developing a system um, a, to um, keep track of whether the lab values are abnormal because they're increased or decreased. Some students like to highlight the left side of the term if it's decreased and the right side of the term if it's increased or vice versa or you could highlight um, just the word or just the number depending on what system you develop it doesn't really matter just develop a system for yourself and be consistent so that every time you encounter lab values in a question stem and you cross-reference them with um, the lab values you will be able to keep track of whether those are abnormal because they're too high or too low 
So here, um, we'll work through these. So hemoglobin 13.2, that's normal. Um, AST of 65 and ALT of 73, those are slightly elevated, so we will highlight those. Creatinine of 1.2 um, is on the upper end of normal, um, but is not too elevated, so we can leave that there. Alkaline phosphatase is very high, so we're going to highlight that. Leukocyte count is also high. Um, we'll highlight that. Total bilirubin and direct bilirubin are also high. Abdominal ultrasound reveals dilated biliary ducts and no fluid collections. IV fluids and piperacillin tazobactam are initiated. So before we go on to look at the answer choices, let's take a moment to synthesize the findings that we have highlighted. So for these um, long stems that have a lot of um, findings in them, exam findings, labs, um, and especially for these complex two-step questions where you need to identify the diagnosis and then be able to answer a question about it, I really recommend taking a few seconds after reading the stem to put the pieces together and identify um, what the diagnosis is. So the idea here is all the elements you've highlighted in the stem are different pieces of the puzzle. And you need to put those pieces together to identify what the diagnosis is before you can even think about the answer choices. So let's take a few seconds to do that step. And some students like to just jot a few things down on their scrap piece of paper. I like to write a few bullet points down because it helps me, if I see them all together, it helps me put those pieces together. Some students are able to do it um, without writing things down. So it depends on you. So here we're gonna have a um, female patient with no major significant medical history presenting with acute right upper quadrant pain, as well as some um, vomiting, although that's pretty nonspecific for GI complaints, but we can add that there. Vomiting, she has fever, and the rest of her exam is notable for scleral icterus, which is a sign which usually goes hand in hand with jaundice. Now, they don't tell us that her skin is jaundiced, but we have enough information in the labs where we don't, um, we can, we don't need to know that she's jaundiced to be able to um, make the diagnosis. And then the labs are consistent. Um, I think it, especially with when you have a lot of these labs, if there's a specific pattern that jumps out at you, so for example, if there's an anemia, putting a label on it saying it's a macrocytic anemia um, with you know, a reticulocyte count that is elevated with reticulocytosis or a uh, normocytic anemia with a abnormally low reticulocyte count, you're able to say that that is a um, production problem, right? That's a bone marrow suppression problem that falls in the normocytic range. So being able to synthesize the labs into putting labels on them really helps with this synthesis step. So here, um, the way I would synthesize these labs with slightly elevated AST and ALT and very elevated ALKFOS and bilirubin, and here this is a direct hyperbilirubinemia, I would say that this is a cholestatic pattern of labs. Of liver labs. And then finally, we have uh, leukocytosis. So when we write it down like this, with all five of these bullet points, putting these elements together, this is a very classic presentation that should jump out at you. And, and after this question, you certainly will be able to recognize this pattern. So the combination of right upper quadrant pain, fever, and scleral icterus or jaundice, um, this is what we call the Charcot triad. So do you remember what this is consistent with? So this is consistent with acute cholangitis and the lab findings of the cholestatic pattern and the leukocytosis are consistent with that. So this is a classic presentation for acute cholangitis. In addition, we have the ultrasound findings of dilated biliary ducts, and that's just an extra. We don't even need that finding to make the diagnosis. Um, but it helps because it's consistent with the diagnosis. So dilated ducts. And we're not told that there are any stones on ultrasound. Now, you won't always be able to visualize stones on ultrasound first. And second, they might not give you that piece of information because that would just be um, a giveaway. But the presence of dilated ducts on ultrasound is consistent with something that is obstructing the biliary tree. And the cholestatic pattern of labs is also consistent with obstruction. Um, and so that goes hand in hand with cholangitis. 
um, because as we remember, cholangitis is an ascending infection in the setting of biliary duct obstruction. So before we go on to the answer choices, let's take a few minutes to review cholangitis because it's a really high yield diagnosis and it most certainly will come up on your exam. So it's caused by an ascending infection due to biliary obstruction and the obstruction can be due to stones, it can be due to bile duct stenosis, it can be due to cancer, either of um, the biliary tree, so cholangiocarcinoma, or it can be cancer from the head of the pancreas, so pancreatic cancer, it can be ampulla vata cancer, it can be any type of cancer in that area, or it can be sphincter of odi dysfunction, which typically happens post cholecystectomy. So although most commonly it's stones, it can also be one of these other causes. So don't be fooled if you don't see stones, but you see something else here, it could still um, lead to a cholangitis picture. So this classically will present with the Charcot triad of fever, jaundice, right upper quadrant pain. Do you remember what two features make it, uh, make the pen tab? So altered mental status and hypotension classically make the Raynaud pen tab. This patient in our stem didn't have the pen tab, just had the Charcot triad. Um, in terms of diagnosis, the labs will show a cholestatic pattern, which are consistent with obstruction of the biliary tree. So, um, and so when you have obstruction, you will have very elevated alkaline phosphatase. You will typically have a direct hyperbilirubinemia, right? Because that bilirubin has already been conjugated. And as it's leaving the liver, um, it gets obstructed. So it's going to be conjugated or direct hyperbilirubinemia. And you can have mildly elevated AST and ALT, um, but these are usually just slightly elevated. They're not usually um, that high in a cholestatic pattern. Now in an intrahepatic pattern, they would be much higher, but this is just a, a cholestatic pattern. So you might see slight elevations, um, but they're not gonna be um, off the charts. On imaging, you'll see biliary dilation on ultrasound. You do not need a CT for this diagnosis. Um, the combination of these things plus the clinical presentation is sufficient to make the diagnosis. Now, in terms of treatment, um, this is an infection. Um, so as with any infection, um, we're going to want to treat that infection with antibiotics. And when you think about our antibiotics, we're going to want to cover enteric gram-negative rods as well as anaerobes. So these are going to be our GI bacteria. And so um, different regimens include piperacillin and tazobactam. You get both gram-negative coverage there as well as anaerobic coverage. You could also use ceftriaxone and metronidazole, which gets you both gram-negative and anaerobic coverage. Similarly, ciprofloxacin or metronidazole. These are all appropriate regimens. Um, and you would also treat this patient with IV fluids. So this would be the supportive aspect. Um, but most importantly, in cholangitis, we need to relieve the obstruction because until we relieve this obstruction, we're not going to be able to um, fix the pro underlying problem. And so that is done with an emergent ERCP, usually within 12 to 24 hours for um, emergent decompression. And eventually, um, if the problem is caused by gallstones, and most commonly it is, you will do a cholecystectomy eventually, but you don't want to do that during the acute illness. So you might do it within that same hospitalization, um, but once they are no longer um, so sick. Um, so eventually you do a cholecystectomy, um, especially if that is due to stones, but um, not if, not while they are acutely ill. So, in our question stem, although the patient, we didn't have any stones visualized, she was a female, she was obese with a BMI of 33, and she was in her 40s. And so that is definitely the setup for gallstones. Um, and although they don't specifically say, it is the most common cause um, of the obstruction in cholangitis. And so we could assume that it's most likely due to gallstones, although again, it doesn't really matter what the underlying cause of the obstruction is um, because the question was about um, the best next step in management. And that would not be something that we would need to do right away. So let's take a look at these answer choices again and we can go through them. So laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So this is, um, this is definitely a trying to trick you to choose this. This would be correct eventually, um, but not the most appropriate next step. So this would be not yet, right? This patient will likely get a cholecystectomy during this hospitalization, but it's not the best next step. So we can cross that one off. Change antibiotic regimen. So this was really testing your knowledge of the correct antibiotic choice 
um, in cholangitis. And so as we've learned, we need something that will cover gram negatives and anaerobes, and this is appropriate. So this one is actually a very appropriate antibiotic choice. So um, if you didn't know that, then you could have perhaps picked B, um, but in this case, it is uh, appropriate antibiotic choice. So B is correct. Abdominal CT. So you might have wanted to choose this because on ultrasound, you didn't necessarily see stones or you didn't see an explanation for um, the obstruction. But again, that's not necessary. And the most important thing is to um, decompress the obstruction before identifying um, the exact cause. And a CT is not necessary for the diagnosis of cholangitis. HIDA scan and transhepatic cholangiography. So these are both um, an example of when they, they include fancy diagnostic studies that you might not know exactly how they work or what they do, and they sound like they could vaguely be related to the system that we're in, but you don't know exactly what they are. And I recommend not typically choosing these answer choices unless you're 100% sure that all the other ones are incorrect, and by that I mean 110% sure, because usually um, there are a few select examples where you do need to know the names of these more advanced imaging studies, but it's usually not the correct answer, um, and they're usually here to trick you. So unless you're 100% sure that that's it, um, I tend to not recommend choosing these diagnostic studies that you're not very familiar with, um, unless, again, the other ones are all uh, very obviously wrong and that's the only answer choice left, or um, you're familiar with the term and you know that it's the right one. So HIDA scan and transhepatic cholangiography are two diagnostic studies um, to visualize the anatomy of the biliary tree, um, but in this case we already have sufficient evidence that there is an obstruction and this patient needs a more urgent procedure. So these are incorrect. ERCP, so this is the correct answer. Um, Patients with cholangitis need emergent ERCP for decompression of the obstruction. Um, and, and so now that we have learned all the high yield information about cholangitis, we know that F is the correct answer. Um, and G, exploratory laparotomy is incorrect. Um, that would um, be too invasive a procedure and um, would not necessarily help us um, decompress that obstruction, especially if it was um, in the biliary tree itself. All right. So um, cholangitis is a very high yield topic. I recommend um, being becoming familiar with all this information. And after this question, you'll be able to recognize this presentation um, whenever you see it in a future question. So that wraps up our question of the week. Thanks so much for listening.